fog and the rain to clear because today is a hugely exciting but slightly terrifying moment as I realise a childhood dream which is to test a 1987 Sauber Mercedes C9 Group C Le Mans car. Group C era of the mid to late 1980s and into the very early 90s is one of sports car racing's most celebrated eras. Stunning silhouette bodied closed roof racers going wheel to wheel at speeds up to 250 miles an hour down the Montsain Strait at Le Mans. Silk cut Jaguars versus Silver Arrows, Mercedes, Rothmans Porsches to name but a few. These are the cars that get real motorsport fans misty-eyed. Today, I get to drive one of the very best, the 1987 Sauber Mercedes C9. Button, mate. Oh, listen to that! So alive, so alert. <laughs> Heavy throw on the gear lever, but. Super precise. This is the worst bit when you drive a new car, you have absolutely no sense of where the grip is, how it feels, don't know how hard to press the brake pedal, how hard to blip the throttle on downshift, all the responses are completely new. I always like to just get this first couple of laps in, drive around slowly on tender hooks as I just dial myself in. Oh, I just got my very first experience of the turbo kicking in then. Just crack the throttle open up to maybe 30%. Bloody hell. Like a huge gust of wind. So jam-like, darting left and right. I'm even struggling to take my eyes off the road to check my upshift points on the rev counter because at those exact moments the car's lurching from one side of the track to the other. Which is quite normal, believe it or not, for such a wide tired, wide tracked car. You feel every single lump and bump.
I've got really conflicting feelings right now because on the one hand I'm just full of disbelief and pure adrenaline and excitement having just had my first ever lapse in the real thing and when I say the real thing I mean I used to draw pictures and build models of these Group C cars when I was a kid and the best of the best was always the Silver Arrows, the Sauber Mercedes and I've just driven one for the first time in my life and that is hugely exciting but at the same time this is a shakedown test this is the very very first laps that this car has done since a huge strip and rebuild that's taken over a year so you have to expect technical glitches and gremlins and we've had one that is sort of restricting our progress at the moment and preventing me from being able to really open the throttle fully and experience the car at full full beans but we'll get there we'll get there So whilst the guys have just popped off to get a sandwich for lunch, let's come and have a quick look up close at the technical details on this extraordinary racing car. Now hidden under its nice warming blanket is the heart of the beast. It's a 5 litre 90 degree V8 with twin KKK turbochargers. And if you look down here, you see the size of these things. Now we've got it on the lowest boost setting that we can program into the car today and it's still got about 700 brake horsepower and about 725 foot-pounds of torque. It's hugely, hugely powerful. But before you make the mistake of thinking, well, that must be undrivable, particularly in wet conditions, when you look at the torque curves on the grass from the dyno, it's very linear and from about 3,000 to 6,000 RPM, which is the real operating range that you tend to use on track, it's very uniform, which gives the drivers a flexible, tractable car and the opportunity to use slightly fewer gears. You can maybe trundle through what would normally be a third gear corner in fourth instead of that extra downshift, which on a long distance race, particularly 24 hours at Le Mans, saves the gearbox by eliminating a huge number of shifts. Now these cars were two meters wide and about four and a half meters long and they generated enormous amounts of downforce. You can imagine a huge proportion of that being generated by this massive barn door rear wing. And come with me to have a look at the front of the car. You see this splitter. It's fairly innocuous looking. It's hugely different to the front wing of a Formula One car, for example but that's where the downforce generation begins. And between this splitter and the back of the car are huge underbody tunnels, diffusers, that get gradually larger as they open up towards the back of the car. And that creates a lot of ground effect, which sucks the car down into the ground. Now the weight of the C9 is 905 kilograms, and yet the amount of downforce that this car can produce at speed in its sprint configuration is two tons that's twice its own weight pushing it down into the ground and that's based on a speed of about 200 miles an hour it's not the easiest thing to get in and out of particularly for a tool driver like me and i honestly don't know how they would have done super fast driver changes in the pit stops in the middle of the races back in the day We're using a quick release steering wheel for safety these days, but it probably would have been fixed in 1987 directly to the column, permanently installed. But once you're in, it's incredibly cosy and you might look around at all this dark space and this very narrow letterbox opening through the windscreen and assume that it's a claustrophobic environment. There's something about the way that it's so tailored to the driver. Everything comes towards you and is so instantly and easily accessible. So let me just talk you through what's going on here. On the steering wheel, we've got just one button, a far cry from the myriad of switches and dials that you see on modern Le Mans and F1 machinery. This is simply a radio button pushed to talk to the guys on the pit wall. Now, over here is what I think is the most interesting dial of all. This is as was in period. This is the boost switch. 
and the rules mandated that drivers were not allowed to change the boost themselves whilst out on the circuit. So it had to be positioned far out of the way, out of reach of the driver for the team to make adjustments to the boost setting from the pit garage. Now working our way across the cockpit, fire extinguisher, very, very normal road car looking hazard light switch there, washers, wipers, light switches, pull to turn those on, ignition switch. And my favorite dial of all in the whole cockpit is this wonderful period preserved handwritten engine map switch. All of these settings would have been pre-programmed for the driver to switch to as conditions change throughout the race. Perhaps, for example, from wet to dry or a safety car period, perhaps they were trying to conserve fuel and needed to run a, a leaner map with less power. Now, a very sensible contemporary addition is this small Motec dash. Next to the Motec dial, we've got a very simple rev counter. The red line marks at 7,000 RPM, which is about what the drivers would have pushed it to in the races. Perhaps at Le Mans, they'd have stuck to six and a half thousand between shifts. And then just a very, very solid, reassuringly straightforward gear lever with a nice short throw. Now this is a five speed H pattern with a dog leg to the left and back to access first. And you tend to use that just for pulling away. And from then on, you're using the four speed H pattern between second and fifth gear out on the circuit. Fingers crossed it works this time. It's still pretty good fun though, isn't it? <laughs> particularly at these low speeds where you haven't got the forces pushing the car out wide. Despite this being a turbocharged engine, the throttle response on the downshift flip is instant, immediate. It makes the gear change feel fantastic. Not even got the space on this straight to open the throttle fully. Late and hard on the brakes, down to second. Piff power through the chicane. Have the hand on the gear lever, nice and early. Walk and forward, required shift. Really standing on it. The car's nice and stable on the brakes. Not a hint of lock up even in these wet conditions, which do make it up the steer through the apex. Try and pick the speed up, get some of that aero working for the crater curves brave enough to muscle the car on too much throttle down through the direction change, taking a slightly wide apex, a bit of a wet line, a bit of oversteer there as the boost kicked in. Got to be on your toes with this. Yellow flag ahead. first experience of oversteer induced by massive arrival of turbo boost in this car. I tell you what, didn't get much warning. Ideal day, but I had a good one. Yeah, exactly, we've done a good function check. Yeah.
oh, I need a minute just to catch my breath. I'm so pleased that we got that last session with a consecutive run of 10 or 12 laps because finally I got a chance to feel what this car is capable of. And let me tell you, this reputation as a bit of a monster is absolutely well earned and justified. It was catching me out, out of the corners as I was delicately feeding in the throttle. I had a couple of snaps of oversteer that I wasn't expecting. Now today, of course, we're on wet tires. It's damp and greasy around the whole lap. And I've yet to experience the car's full potential in dry conditions with access to the full rev range and all the power that it's capable of producing. So let's call this part one of two. The car's scheduled for some hot weather testing in a couple of months from now. Let's see if we can wrap this film up with full experience. Thank you.